Can we start now? Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to our session. So uh, in this session, uh, we're going to talk about basically the future of NFV. How do you get over the virtualization phase into the more cloud native NFV? This is a joint presentation by Mellanox Technologies and uh, MetaSwitch Networks. So my name is Chloe Jen Ma. I'm the Senior Director of uh, Cloud Market Development at Mellanox. And here with me is uh, Colin Chagenza Dancer. So he is from the UK with a beautiful British accent. And he's. Uh, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> he's the director of architecture at uh, MetaSwitch Networks. So if you're from the telco space, you probably have heard about uh, MetaSwitch. So they're. Uh, among the first batch to be selected as uh, one of the domain to the AT&T domain 2.0 vendors. So they are a BNF software vendor. So we are in the middle of a transformation uh, for the telco industry. And for any kind of transformation, you go through stages. So let's look at an analogy <coughs> of a digital transformation. So this is a five-year-old writing a blog. So he calls himself a digital native. So he was born into technology. So all the iPads and uh, di different tools come natural to him. And then he calls his parents digital immigrants because uh, the parents uh, can actually learn to use new technologies, but they were not born into this era. And when it comes to his grandparents, uh, it's. Um, Forgive his uh, language, uh, they call them uh, digital retards, and they can barely use a, a toaster. And when it comes to uh, the NFV transformation, we're also seeing three different phases, from the hardware appliances to basically um, network function cloudification. The first phase uh, is cloud Neanderthals, so basically, if you look at uh, the telco industry and uh, the, the vendors, they're going through a consolidation phase. Like your Cisco, Juniper, they're putting a lot more services onto their edge routers. And uh, with that, they can do certain kind of uh, flexible configuration, but it's definitely not very scalable. And with NFV, I call NFV the first phase uh, a cloud immigrants. So basically, um, most of the BNF vendors I talk to, they're simply just moving whatever software they're running on hardware appliances to running on virtual machines without really changing much of the software architecture at all. So with that, you do get some advantages of like being orchestrated by a cloud management platform like OpenStack, but it really will hit a lot of scalability and uh, resiliency issues that we'll talk about later. And looking into the future, we think uh, uh, NFV is going to go cloud native. So in that space, the services will be re-architectured so that uh, they're natively running in the cloud so they can dynamically scale and recover from failure in a scale out manner. So although your infrastructure hardware may not be 5.9 availability, but through the software and the manual and the hardware all together, you can achieve very high um, availability and reliability through a different way. So quickly looking at an example of uh, a firewall. So traditionally, pre-virtualization, if you want to scale up a firewall service, um, you need to put in more boxes. And these boxes are normally one-to-one -one redundancy to achieve high availability. And in front of these firewalls, you need to have a session-aware load balancer in the sense that it really needs to know which packets to send to which firewall box. Because these firewall boxes are heavily stateful, and uh, they only keep the session information when the session was created on that box. And then when we look at post-virtualization phase, most of the firewall vendors I talk to, their software is exactly the same. I mean, mostly the same as what's running in the 
pre-virtualization phase. But they can run them on virtual machines. They're st still heavily stateful in the sense that uh, the session database is still tightly coupled with the firewall processing array uh, themselves. And then you still need, although your load balancer may be virtualized, you still need them to be session aware because uh, these state, uh, this uh, firewall virtual machine themselves are stateful. So in the next phase, how do we make the firewall service scale much better at the application level? Uh, so we must split the firewall application itself into the state, stateless firewall processing array and uh, the stateful storage. So basically, when you separate your state into a logically centralized uh, cloud storage, you can almost scale up and down your firewall processing array infinitely. And also, when you want to recover from a failure, for example, one of your virtual machine comes down, uh, you can just adjust the load balancer so that uh, the load gets distributed to other virtual machines. So it's much easier to do uh, service upgrade and um, recovery from fault. So what does it take to achieve cloud-native NFV? It's really a teamwork. From the application perspective, the VNFs, they need to be stateless and uh, break into microservices. And uh, at the orchestration level, I think uh, the previous speaker also addressed this, you need to have an intelligent manual layer that can really collect statistics from the infrastructure and see how it operates, and then feed that back to the orchestrator itself so that you can optimize and adjust your resources in real time. And then from the infrastructure, you must have an efficient infrastructure to be able to support your um, cloud-native VNFs and your intelligent manual. So first, we talk about applications. What do we mean by cloud-native VNFs? So you must be able to auto-provision them. Uh, you cannot have a whole lot of manual intervention. And also auto-scaling. So this capability is already available in the OpenStack infrastructure. But you must be able to get your VNFs to be able to scale very easily. And auto-healing from uh, the errors. How do you do this transformation? So traditionally, when we look at the VNF applications, they are very monolithic. Although internally they might be broken into components, they're still built into this one big image and deployed as one whole entity. So they're very monolithic. And in that sense, it's very intimidating for the software developers. Even though you're changing like just one line of code, you still need to build this whole thing. And it's very high risk for faster changes. And also, as we mentioned, the VNFs are still heavily stateful. So the first step of transformation is really to break that uh, monolithic application into multiple microservices so that uh, each module is much easier to handle. And you also have a much smaller failure domain. And each of these components, microservices, can scale independently. And also, it's a transformation from stateful to stateless so that uh, your uh, application itself can scale much easily. So the benefit is very easy to see. Um, very small failure domain, better scalability and resiliency. And also, because you have smaller components, uh, you have better business agility to be able to do continuous integration and continuous uh, development. But it does have impact on the NFV infrastructure. Now that you're broken, well, now that you're breaking the application into multiple microservices, you have much denser VNF instances. They can run in virtual machines or containers, but you potentially have much more VNF instances on a physical server. And also, you have much higher requirement on storage performance, because now your state is not associated with your transaction processing anymore. And you will have much higher volume of east-west traffic between VNFs. 
So with that, uh, I'm actually going to invite Colin to talk about how they are going through this journey of making their VNFs cloud native. Thank you, Chloe. So for those of you who don't know about mesh switch networks, we've been around for just over 30 years now, uh, writing complex, highly available software, mainly in the telecoms and networking world. And if there's something that the last 30 years has taught us is that technology changes and it changes fast, and you either evolve with it or, frankly, you die. There are lots of examples of companies out there that had dominant positions in the world, uh, yet even a few years later, they're not around anymore. So what we do is we regularly uh, review our product range, look at our customers, what they need, uh, and sometimes make quite radical changes in our product line. Uh, we did this for some of our telecoms products in 2011. Uh, and it was really inspired by the success of the over-the-top players in the telecoms market and trying to figure out for our customers how the telecom carriers could compete in this world. Uh, and we asked ourselves a fairly simple question. What would a free telco provided voice, video, and messaging service look like? Uh, it was pretty obvious to us that it was going to be in the cloud environment. Uh, but we decided to start with a clean sheet of paper. So this wasn't about adapting and carrying forward our existing software. This was how would we do it from scratch. And we decided to think like a startup. So we wanted to copy the cloud design paradigms, and we wanted to leverage as much open source software as we can. There's no point reinventing the wheel. So uh, as Chloe has said, uh, most of the heart of designing for the cloud is thinking about state where it's stored, how you manipulate it. Uh, if we're producing a SIP product, which is what we wanted to do uh, for this market, it's SIP state we're talking about. So this is things like subscriber profile state, which is the configured information about individual subscribers. Registration state, so this is devices that have connected into you, knowing where they are, having their contact details. And dialogue state, you're in the middle of processing a call, you need to know how far you've got, are you alerting, is the call being dropped, that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of this state. Uh, and every time we process a message, we're basically manipulating this state. We might be updating registration information, looking at some configured information, or just storing where we are in the call. Now, in a traditional box-based system, all of this state is stored within individual boxes. And if you want to think about things like load balancing and all the rest of it, it has to be stateful. You have to be directing the messages towards the box that has the particular bit of state you need in it. Uh, but we decided that wasn't the right way to go about it. We didn't just want to port our existing products forward. We wanted to copy the cloud paradigm. So here's an example of the architecture uh, that we selected. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of the sordid details, because I suspect not many of you are uh, interested in the finer points of IMS. But, but I will talk about some of the structural elements. So right on the left-hand side, we have Bono. Uh, this is the edge proxy. So this is the... Uh, software element that individual subscribers connect into when they activate their device. Uh, and this manages things like uh, uh, negotiating firewalls or traffic. Once the user device is attached to that, it basically stays attached to that for the duration of a registration. Now, there's a horizontally scaled pool of those, uh, variable in size, and we spread incoming traffic over that just using DNS uh, round robin load balancing. So we don't need a particular load balancer box in there. We just use the flexibility in the protocol to do that. In the middle, we have Sprout. This is a bit that's actually doing the SIP routing. Now, it has to have lots of dynamic ephemeral state. This is the, you know, where am I in the call? Uh, what registration information do I have? Uh, and it needs to be, because we want to scale it, it needs to be spread between all of the instances. So I'll come on to in a minute. For that, we chose to use memcached to allow us to spread that dynamic state of information amongst all the instances. And then that's complemented by two other horizontal pools of servers, Homer, which stores uh, XML documents describing uh, the configuration required for the subscriber's devices, and Homestead, which uh, basically stores a cache of subscriber profile information. So this would naturally be in an HSS, but for performance reasons, you cache it locally. For those two things, we want more persistence. So we selected Cassandra as the back-end data store. What advantages does this architecture bring us? Well, the first thing to say is all of the elements are active all the time. Now, that might not sound like a major advantage, but the classic problem with active standby is when your active instance fails, is your standby actually in a good state? If you've chosen to use an active-active model, you know whether an instance is working or not because it's got traffic going through it all the time. So it brings you a degree of confidence. Uh, 
by selecting n plus m rather than 1 plus 1, we get much greater efficiency. We don't have to have a spare machine for every one that's running. We only have to have enough spare instances to cover the size, the chunk of capacity that could fail. Uh, scale out's trivial. As I said, we've got the load balancing element. We just fire up more instances and adjust the load balancing. Uh, there's no in architectural, uh, inherent architectural limitations on scale. Uh, everything runs in parallel. We don't have bottlenecks. And as I said, because we haven't got an explicit load balancer box in there, we don't need to worry about bottlenecks from the load balancer itself, which is a problem you often come across. And frankly, it just looks right. You know, if you showed that picture to uh, you know, a core open stack dev, they'd say, yeah, well, that's a, a cloud native application. Whereas, frankly, if you take a lot of telecoms applications and show their architectural pictures, it'll be, oh, <laughs> that's from you know, 10 years ago. But what about the state storage function? You know, it's wonderful to offload the state to another device, but that doesn't make the problem go away. You still have certain requirements for maintaining that state. And those requirements are normally, it's got to be scalable, it's got to be distributed, and it's got to be fault tolerant. Uh, now, there are well-proven open source ways of doing this. You've got Apache, Cassandra, MongoDB, HBase, MemStoreD, you know, the list goes on. When you're designing an application for this kind of thing, You've got to tailor the state store that you're using to the particular requirements that you have. So that means things like read and write performance, latency throughput. It also means thinking about the nature and the size of the data you're storing. You know, are they large files? Is it key value information? And you need to think about persistency. Is this stuff that, you know, when the system stops, you can afford to throw away? Or is it stuff that actually you need to have a persistent copy? For Clearwater, which is the name of this project, uh, Cassandra fitted the bill for the persistent information. So that's the device and the subscriber profile information, and memcached for the dynamic state. Now, deployment details remain important. I'm not going to tell you that simply selecting the right technology gives a viable deployment. It doesn't. You have to worry about disk subsystems, network, overall topology. You know, there are lots of ways you can get this wrong. But if you've selected the right components, uh, you can achieve some pretty impressive results. Now, I've actually got some uh, uh, performance data, not from our own systems, but from Netflix, which is public information. The biggest thing to show about this takeaway from this graph is actually the fact it's a straight line. At the heart of their business is the fact that they can serve up traffic to their subscribers just by increasing the number of servers. There's not a bottleneck in here. It's just, want to serve more people? You increase the number of servers that they've got. And they're using uh, uh, Cassandra to serve uh, a large chunk of their uh, data. And they get a pretty impressive... Uh, performance figure, but the most important thing, as I said, is it's a, virtually a straight line. So as you want to increase capacity, you just add more of them. And the same is effectively true of uh, Clearwater. So what are the results? We developed and tested quickly. Uh, I must confess it was on Amazon AWS, but it was kind of 2011, and it was something that was available and stable. Prototyping quickly proved uh, the viability of this approach. Uh, we've scalability tested up to 15 million subscribers and 8,000 calls a second, but that's just a test point. That's not a, it only works up to that. If we'd thrown more hardware at it, uh, we could have gone higher. Fault tolerance has been tested in a geo-redundant fashion. So we've spread those instances, not just across individual uh, cloud instances, but we spread them across geographic locations. So you automatically get protection against you know, earthquake, flood, fire, and failure of individual cloud instances, which you know is a good thing because it's still hard to provide a, if you've gone to some of the other talks, it's hard to provide a fully HA cloud instance. Uh, we updated it pretty easily to support the three GPP IMS interfaces. We released it as open source in May 2013 because that's part of the nature of what we're trying to do here. Uh, and the first production deployment was in March 2014. Chloe. Okay, thanks Colin. So uh, that's uh, basically what the applications need to go through to be cloud native. So the next thing in uh, the whole NFV architecture is uh, the manual. So what does it take for the manual to be um, facilitating a cloud native NFV? So basically the manual shouldn't be simply taking policies from your OSS BSS and uh, just do the resource allocation. It shouldn't be a one-way street. It should really be a closed loop in the sense that after it allocates the compute storage and network resources and do the policy-driven service orchestration, it must be able to efficiently collect statistics from the infrastructure itself 
and then run that through potentially a big data analytics engine so that you, it can really provide insights about the health of your system. So I think in OpenStack, you have uh, the chillometer and you have heat. So that's basically the first step to achieve a cloud native being a feedback loop. So if you want to achieve that, um, really you need real-time big data analytics so that you can get insight and then do the real-time feedback so that you can adjust your infrastructure very quickly. And last but not least is the infrastructure itself. So uh, we talked about basically now you have VNFs that has the capabilities to scale up and down really easily. And you also have a manual that can intelligently figure out when I should scale these VNFs and services up and down. So, but you still need a, VN, VN, uh, a VNF, NFV infrastructure that supports easy deployment and portability of uh, these VNFs. And you need to do that without performance penalty. So when we look at uh, the spectrum of uh, VNF deployment options, uh, we look at uh, virtual machines on one end of the spectrum. They have very good manageability and scalability, but they're just a little heavyweight. And uh, if not implemented right, you may have a performance penalty. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have hardware segmentation. This gives you maximum performance, bare metal performance, but it's a little hard to scale. So increasingly, we're seeing uh, people like the VNF vendors and the telco service providers, they're looking into uh, using container, Linux containers such as Docker, so that uh, you can have a lighter weight virtualization scheme while maintaining the portability. But no matter what, so for whether you choose a, a virtual machine type of deployment or container type of deployment, both can benefit from uh, an SDN, SDN network virtualization to be able to port across multiple environments. So this can be, for example, port across different clusters in the same data center or across different, different data centers or across different cloud. So when you have, uh, for example, IoT type of deployment, you want really low latency. So it's very likely that your VNF are going to deployed, be deployed in the essential office, which has limited capacity. So you really want the ability to be able to burst your excessive workload into uh, a nearby central office or even another service provider central office or maybe a cloud service provider's data center that's close by. And uh, both virtual machine and Docker gave you very good portability. So now that we established two key things. So one is uh, you're going to have more entities on the same server and across your environment to communicate with each other. So they must do this very efficiently and securely. And the second thing is once you separate uh, the state from the transaction processing, you're going to have like very efficient storage access to make sure that not only your control VNFs, but also the VNFs that involve packet state, like packet gateways, can become cloud native. So storage is actually a key element in your telco cloud. So um, at Mellanox, we focus on uh, basically the NFV infrastructure. We want to build the most efficient virtual network to support cloud-native NFV. So that not only include a network that allows you to do near line rate packet processing, but also in terms of storage, because of the acceleration and offload that we do, you can achieve much, much higher IOPS at a much lower latency. And we do all these because a lot of these processing are offloaded to the NIC hardware itself so that you don't really have any like, significant CPU overhead. So that your precious CPU resources can be dedicated to actually do the service processing, not the packet processing. 
So that's when we say uh, your compute is also more efficient because now you have more CPUs to run more workload on the same, same physical infrastructure. So we achieve all these through three key things. So one is virtualization, and the second one is acceleration, and third one is convergence. So we'll look at them one by one. First, uh, virtualization and offload. So there is a technology called uh, single root I.O. virtualization. So this is how we facilitate high performance virtualization for um, compute virtualization. Basically, when you move from bare metal to virtual machines, there is a virtualization penalty that you normally need to pay. But with uh, SRIOV, we are virtualizing the physical NIC function into multiple virtual functions at the hardware level so that each of the virtual function can be associated with a virtual machine. So the virtual machines themselves can communicate directly with your networking device, that's your uh, NIC card on your servers. So that uh, the end result is you can achieve near bare metal performance when you are running virtualization. So let's take a look at uh, basically the result of uh, SRLV plus eSwitch. So eSwitch is an embedded switch that handles packet processing in the NIC itself. So with our latest generation of uh, adapter card, we actually achieved close to 100 Gbps on a single interface. And this is virtual machine to virtual machine. That's across your, um, cut through your hypervisor and kernel layer. And we achieve very good memory isolation at the hardware level with very low CPU overhead. So as you can see on this picture, on a 100G interface, we achieved somewhere between 92 to about 95 Gbps of uh, uh, throughput from one virtual machine on one physical server to another virtual machine on another physical server. And we do that at a very low CPU overhead. And, uh, but SRLV doesn't solve the problem of uh, overlay SDN. So that solves the problem of the penalty you need to pay for compute virtualization. But you still need to handle network, fun network virtualization. And at this point of time, a lot of network function virtuali network virtualization is done through an SDN scheme that's an overlay style of SDN. So with overlay style of SDN, basically the SDN controllers set up tunnels on top of your physical switch fabric. And uh, with tunnels, your packet format changes. So before um, the tunnel, before uh, overlay, um, network virtualization, you have the green part of the packet, plus the, the CRC, the checksum. And with uh, an additional layer of uh, overlay, you will have the outer packet. Here I'm using uh, VXLAN as an example. So after you do this, the tunneling protocol themselves actually introduce another layer of packet processing. So you have to first look at the outer packet and then uh, decapsulate that, and then look at the inner packet to be able to direct that to the right virtual machine. So uh, this looks trivial, but it actually may break some of the NIC hardware offloading because the inner packets are no longer accessible by the NIC. And the NIC, some of the NICs wouldn't know where the offset of the checksum really is. And so uh, with, a non, with a NIC that doesn't support <coughs> um, overlay offloading like the VXLAN offload, basically the inner packet is pointed to the CPU, and the CPU need to do the packet processing itself, which really slows it down. So uh, at Mellanox, our NICs actually support both stateless uh, offload for both um, encapsulated packets like the VXLAN tunnel packet and the native Ethernet packets themselves. So with that, you see a big uh, performance impact. So we've worked with multiple SDN controller vendors like uh, 
Plum Grade, Midokura, New Watch, and uh, VMware NSX. And this is what we've seen. So the light green bar actually shows. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So the light green bar actually shows uh, the VM connected by VLAN. So basically, uh, this is our base, uh, base case. And uh, then the dark green bar actually shows, actually the red bar shows uh, basically virtual machine to virtual machine communication with VXLAN, but no offload at the NIC. So as you can see, on a 40G interface, you can get to about 17, somewhere between 10 and 20 Gbps of throughput. But the moment you turn on VXLAN offload, that's the, the dark green bar that you see. We get to a performance that's very, very close to native VLAN performance. So that's the performance that's without the tunneling, the outer packet. And uh, you see a little bit of gap between the VLAN performance and uh, VXLAN with hardware offload, because uh, this is done with uh, our previous gener our Connect X3 generation of NIC. So it only does uh, stateless offload. It doesn't do stateful offload for the inner packet like in-cap and decap. And with Connect X4 that's coming out now, we support both stateless and stateful outflow. So you will see these two bars getting very close to each other and near line rate. And so this is a, a look at uh, the CPU on the receiving host and uh, on the sending host. So the effect is actually more uh, pronounced on the receiving host. You can see that uh, CPU utilization is about half of, uh, I mean, with hardware offload compared to without hardware offload. And uh, we tested that uh, on a 20 core system, we saved seven cores. They're freed up to basically not run packet processing anymore. They can be dedicated to actually do service processing. So very huge gains in terms of uh, efficiency. And then uh, let's take another look at the second technology, which is our acceleration technology with RDMA. Uh, RDMA stands for Remote Direct Memory Access. So as Colin mentioned, when you separate out the state from the transaction processing, you really, well, what's ideal for you? You really want the virtual machines to be able to access memory, no matter whether it's on your local machine or it's on another remote host in the same cluster or in a different cluster. So RDMA does just that. So uh, RDMA is a, a transport layer protocol, similar to C TCP IP uh, in the OSI layer. Uh, but the difference is uh, it was designed in like much later than uh, TCP IP. So it's designed to be able to be offloaded by the hardware itself so that it can achieve uh, very low latency, very high throughput without CPU penalty. And we can actually run RDMA at uh, 100 G BPS. So um, RDMA originally was uh, an InfiniBand protocol, mostly used in high performance computing clusters. But we've um, moved RDMA from not only supporting InfiniBand, but also supporting Ethernet. So you can run RDMA over converged Ethernet, we call it Rocky, and uh, it's also routable across different routing domains. So even though in your data, data center you run layer three, you can still use RDMA to do fast memory transfer. So Colin mentioned that uh, uh, for some of their uh, for the clear water application, they actually use memcached for the, the really, the, the fast state they need to access. So uh, let's take a look at uh, some of the enhancements that RDMA brings to memcached. So basically on the, the left-hand side, you can see that uh, in terms of latency, the green bar shows uh, memcached with RDMA, and uh, the red bar shows 
RD, I mean, memcached with uh, TCP. So you can see that the latency is reduced by about 66%. So you only have one third of the latency with, uh, when you use memcached over RDMA. And then uh, in terms of uh, throughput, uh, also red line means uh, memcached over TCP, and uh, green line means uh, memcached over RDMA. So you have about 200% performance enhancement for memcached over RDMA. So this is significant improvement. Uh, I think clear water itself is actually more of a, a, a control plane VNF, so it really doesn't handle packet state. But there are actually VNFs that will handle packet. Uh, they need to get the state from, for example, memcached on a per packet basis, which definitely have much higher performance requirement. So with this enhancement, we can enable more VNFs to think about moving to cloud native. And uh, Colin also mentioned that uh, they use for persistency for information that need to be persistent. They use uh, database applications such as uh, Cassandra. We work with uh, a lot of the database application providers, but we also want to enable um, the acceleration from the lowest denominator, which is actually uh, the block storage or file storage. So here, uh, I want to use block storage as an example. So we have uh, accelerated iSCSI with RDMA, so we call it ISER. And uh, ISER is integrated with OpenStack already. So if you look at the performance enhancement, without ISER, so you see the two bottom line in terms of uh, throughput, so that's your pure iSCSI. And when we enhance it with ISER, you can see about six times of throughput enhancement and five times lower I.O. latency. And we do that at a much lower CPU utilization. Okay. Okay. So this is my timer. We're almost done. Um, so last but not least is convergence. So this is more from an operation and management perspective. So with such a large pipe that can work for both VM to VM, VM communication and uh, VM to storage communication. You really can converge your storage and uh, network, I mean, your storage access and your network access into the same pipe so that it's much easier to manage. So, this is a summary slide. Uh, we work very closely with uh, OpenStack. And so our involvement is mostly with uh, Neutron and uh, with Cinder. So for Cinder, we provide an ISER plugin so that uh, uh, any block storage access, you can uh, leverage RDMA acceleration. And uh, for Neutron, our SRILV and VXLAN implementation are all in our Neutron plugin. So we work upstream, so these are commonly available in Juno and Kilo, and also we integrate with uh, multiple uh, OpenStack distros like Mirantis, Red Hat, and uh, Ubuntu. Uh, with that, uh, thanks for your attention, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, now is the time and for Colin and me. Is there, a, is there a scale point that it starts to break down? And I mean, when you, when you talk about breaking everything up into stateless, and, and obviously you're working with AT&T, if you're talking about the mobility side, or Verizon, or Deutsche, you know, uh, Timo, or any of the big carriers, there's so much state in the network. Mm -hmm. At what point does the replication of that state, the retrieval of that state from a state cache, uh, scale out and, and start to lose that efficiency? over the bare metal separation and, and memory state. Okay, yeah. I, I think it primarily uh, depends on the particular protocol. You, you, you mentioned that. Yeah, it's on there. Uh, I, I think it depends on the nature of the protocol. In our particular example, uh, with Clearwater and SIP, 
Uh, I think we're pretty confident that uh, we're in the kind of Netflix situation and uh, we've, we've got the architectural performance if you've got the customers. Uh, I, I think there are definitely applications, especially with more complex protocols that are less easily optimized for this kind of approach, that you will hit problems and you'll find that your, the need for frequent access to shared state will be a limiting factor. Uh, for clear water, it isn't, but yeah, there, there will be cases. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, I think, I think uh, our time is up, and thank you very much. Thank you.